global conflict is on the rise because people are losing their minds. If you were eating a daily buffet of information that's been highly processed by social media and the news, you are going to break your own brain. Just like how highly processed food destroys your body, a junk food diet of triggering slanted information is going to destroy your ability to think well. You've got to train yourself to avoid traps and see through the BS. That was entrepreneur Tom B. Liu in the opening to a conversation he had with behavioural scientist Dan O'Reilly. Welcome to Joffe Whispers, my name is Nairi. Do we really own our own thoughts? Can we control our thoughts? Can we see through the BS, as Tom said? What is free will? I always believed I own my own thoughts until an incident about Gosh, 40 years ago, when I was a secondary college teacher, I was, in, I was invited to an introductory evening to a self-empowerment course by a colleague of mine. And I had sat through the first half of the evening. I wasn't really convinced and a few things that happened during the interval persuaded me that I didn't, certainly did not want to do the course. So I went down the stairs to my car, but for some reason, as soon as I got to the exit of the building, I turned around, went back up the stairs and signed a check to do the course. Uh, not, not really thinking much about it, but as I was driving home in the car, there was a moment in which I felt as if I'd suddenly woken out of a trance or something. It was very strange and I called a friend, uh, asked her if she knew about this group and her response was yes, stay away from them, they're dangerous. So of course I cancelled the check and fortunately my hard earned money didn't go out to something that wasn't going to help me. But I was very frightened by that incident because it was the first time in my life I realised how vulnerable we are, how easily our thoughts can be manipulated. And on pondering this incident further, my thinking comes back to something I talk about quite a lot, which is fear. I contend that most of our thoughts and our behaviours are based on some form of fear, mostly very subtle fears that we're absolutely not conscious of, fears of public shaming or fears of appearing to be selfish or uh, fear of ostracism, uh, fear of appearing ignorant is a big one, um, of not being socially responsibility. You get the idea. When we're fearful, especially of an unknown vaguely perceived threat, we act instinctively. We go into survival mode and prefer to stay with the familiar rather than engage the possibility that there's another even more threatening danger lurking in the background. In the situation I described above, my tenuous conclusion is that I was operating from the fear that I might be missing out on something that could change my life the better. That's a big thing. But how? How can someone else have the key to my well-being? Think about that. How can someone else know something I don't know about myself? Well, retrospectively, they don't, unless there's a specific question I need to ask in relation to a specific problem. In other words, there is no blanket process that can apply to all human beings because we all come from our own individual combination of genes, our own personal experience, our social cultural heritage, our own particular personality, and our own interpretation of what happens in our lives. You know, two people can witness the same event and have completely different interpretations. And yet we're constantly coming to a consensus with others about what we think, about our opinions, about what's best for us. But as US General George S. Payton famously said, if everyone is thinking alike, then somebody isn't thinking. Or to repeat one of my own quotes, we all have moments where subtle persuasion 
overrides common sense. We live in an extraordinary time where we can all communicate with one another in real time at any single moment in time with men without mental space to contemplate what we're about to say and consider whether we are expressing our own opinion or whether we are repeating an idea we have picked up on the internet, on a television set which matches our own biases or which triggers our own fears and prompts an intuitive response. I constantly see comments under YouTube videos which are clearly not thought out, thought through and which indicate the author has neither absorbed nor understood what is being said and yet they feel free to comment. Uh, just this morning someone was saying anyone can understand science if they take the trouble to educate themselves. Well that's all very well but four years at university isn't just about reading science, it's about learning complex ideas, it's about remembering complex um, technical data, um, it's about going into a laboratory and doing research. Well, most people can't do that. Most people don't have a laboratory at home nor the skills to use it. How many non-scientists can do complicated research or read and understand scientific papers? If you've ever tried to read one as I have, they are just like a foreign language to most of us. So what he says lacks common sense. And from his language, it seemed that his ego and his fears were more important than any knowledge he had because it was obvious that he knew nothing. He thought he did, but he, he was showing his own ignorance and proud of it. That's what was really strange. When people who lack deep knowledge of a subject come in contact with more informed individuals, the inevitable small fears creep up, um, especially that of inferiority, and there's often that instinct to attack the expert or dig oneself into a deeper pit of ignorance as though it's a virtue. This is a form of delusion that is becoming increasingly common. Why is it that so many online comments are personal attacks, often highly vindictive, rather than an offer of an alternative idea which might add to the knowledge base rather than destroy what exists? Now, I'm not talking about bots. I'm talking about the people who, literally, who real people, where does that delusion of knowledge, despite evidence to the contrary, come from? Why are so many deluded into beliefs that are increasingly remote from reality? And I come back briefly to Alvin Toffler and Future Shock. Um, I've mentioned him a number of times now and Orson Welles' description of Future Shock as an illness that comes from too much change in too short a period of time. And I contend that we are right in, we are in the middle of future shock right now. The US National Library of Medicine has a, a description of mass formation psychosis, which is a social phenomenon which consists of collective anxiety due to a threat or a perceived threat and can culminate in a cascade of symptoms suggested, suggestive of organic disease without an identifiable cause. Its history dates back to the 14th century, so it's a known phenomenon and it impacts people from all cultures and regions of the world. Before the 20th century, MPI emerged across Europe, often in socially isolated Convents, in other words, social isolation is a big factor. And we went through that during the pandemic and in highly stressful situations. And there you have the words, collective anxiety due to a perceived threat, a perceived threat. And we are surrounded by many perceived threats right now. We neither know whether they're real nor how they might affect us into the future. Viruses, climate change, injections, nuclear war, possible alien invasion, enforced medical interventions, the um, uh, genocide going on in the Middle East right now, 
cashless trading, having our freedoms curtailed, having our children removed in some instances, mass illegal migration, many more. According to the late psychologist Carl Jung, the greatest threat to civilization is not the forces of nature, nor with any physical disease, but our inability to deal with the forces of our own psyche. And what effect does that all have on the way we think, the way we perceive the world, to come back to the subject of this podcast? How do we know if our thoughts are our own or if we're caught up in the collective psyche? Well, for a start, if we spend many hours in front of a television set or on the computer, as Tom Bilyeu said, our information base is limited to whatever's been presented. It's always biased in the interests of whoever presents the material. And if we watch the messages repeatedly, then it becomes part of our thinking. In other words, it's brainwashing. That's really what it is. Joseph Goebbels said, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. And much of it is subliminal. In other words, we don't even notice it's happening. That's why advertisements are repeated throughout longer programs. We might think we ignore them, but at some level they sink into our subconscious. And there's no better way to demonstrate how that works than to watch the Darren Brown program. Um, and I've posted two links below to um, Darren Brown, uh, to Darren Brown's work, um, which I recommend you watch if you haven't heard of him already. Um, you'll find it pretty unnerving, but really you should watch. And if you've heard of PSYOPs, that is psychological warfare, you'll know it's part of the machinery of war and involves the planned use of propaganda and other psychological operations to influence the opinions, emotions, attitudes and behaviour of opposition groups. They're planned and coordinated intelligence operations designed to target people's vulnerabilities and influence them. Now, legally, PSYOPs should not be used domestically against a country's own citizens, but of course it happens. It's very tempting to use those powerful tools if you are someone who wants power. And it happens in many different guises, much of us persuading that the enemy is a foreign country, which needs to be eliminated, particularly Russia. Um, but it can be many things, viruses, climate change, you know. Um, in a document entitled Psychological Operations by Goldstein and Findlay from Air University Press, Maxwell Air Force 3 Base, Alabama, in 1996, nearly 30 years ago, all major governments in the world today, and many of the minor ones, spend varying amounts of time, money and attention on attempts to influence the opinions of their own citizens. That's a public statement. When you can provide a common enemy, it's easy to distract people from more immediate issues that affect them directly, such as their standard of living or their loss of freedoms, and to change the status quo with regard to government decisions and regulations which may have profound negative effects on the general population in the future. When you distract people away from the main game, it's easy to find the goalpost. And of course, the best way to distract people from thinking too much is entertainment. When colour television sets were first introduced in Australia, I think in the late 1970s, sometime like that, the I said at the time, this is the modern equivalent of the Colosseum, and I predicted that the restrictions on explicit violence and sexually explicit material would be gradually eased off while no one was paying attention. And they did. Firstly, it was the movies, movies such as Last Tango in Paris and Clockwork Orange. The film industry has infiltrated our lives with fantasies and morally questionable scenarios which have been integrated into our worldview over several generations. We've become immune 
to violence and to vulgar sexual imagery in public. It's, this has been going on for a long time, which when I was young would have resulted in imprisonment. You wouldn't have got away with it. It happens subtly over a period of time. And the pressure to be not such a prude or out of date or an old fogey, those personal shaming tools are very powerful in lowering the accepted social and cultural standards of the Western world over the last few generations. And why do we need standards? Well, if our lives are about family, about the next generation, about moving forward, then what are we offering the next generation if we don't offer them powerful moral and spiritual standards? What else is there? <laughs>
we are fed a banquet of fear by politicians and the media on a daily basis. Why? Well, because if we're fearful, as I keep saying, we tend to be compliant with regulations, which appear, appear to keep us safe, but which are not finally in our best interest. We can never really be safe. Life was never safe and never will be. It's short and it's impossible to know how long we'll remain in this physical form. If we try to stay safe rather than take up a sword, face our fear directly and look for the wizard behind the curtain, then we stand to lose both our safety and our freedom. Think about that. My father once said to me, life is dangerous, go live it. I've never forgotten it and I've lived well, I assure you because I'm fearless. Not stupid, but fearless. And why do we not see the truth? Why do we not see what's really going on? Because we're bombarded constantly with untruths. We become confused by information overload. Some of it true, some of it false. But it's very difficult to tell them apart these days. And then what happens? We take the path of least resistance, not because we think and believe it's the best way, but because we've been persuaded into believing it, to believing it through fear of possible consequences and with fear comes lack of discernment. Where the deep shadows of fear reside, truth is often lost. One of my quotes. When everyone thinks the same way, no one is thinking. When we make enemies of those who don't subscribe to the popular myths that we believe in, we are not thinking. And we are certainly not thinking with a rational mind. Good science is about having an open mind. You know, those scientific theories, very few scientists will say when they've written a paper that that's the definitive answer. Science doesn't work like that. It's, this is what we know so far, what can we do with it? And then we'll work into the future. That's good science. What's the future? If you doubt what I've just said about climate change, and I'm not a scientist, I'm not pretending to be knowledgeable, I'm simply doing my own research and reporting what I find. But I recommend you listen to Richard Linson uh, he's an atmospheric physicist who has authored more than 200 scientific papers. He was a professor at Harvard and until his retirement, he was professor of meteorology at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, which for those who don't know it is a highly respected, or was anyway, a highly respected research institute in the United States. Professor Linson calls the climate change narrative climate alarmism. You may not be convinced by what he has to say, but a balanced exploration opens the way for us to come to our own viewpoint and some kind of consensus armed with knowledge rather than somebody else's opinion, rather than public opinion and somebody else's agenda. And even scientists are susceptible to opinion. They're mo no means infallible. And this is a very pertinent one to the moment. In a series entitled The Viral Delusion, one of the scientists interviewed, I think it was Dr Tom Cohen, said something very interesting and worth taking note of. He was in conversation with a colleague some years ago about viruses. And the colleague asked him, how he knew viruses cause disease, or even if they exist. And his response was, well, everybody knows viruses exist. We were taught about them in medical school. People get sick. But the colleague repeated the question and asked him if he knew, if he knew, in other words, had he done any research himself to find out if viruses were true, and he was taken aback and decided, well, perhaps he should educate himself. So he started looking for research papers on viruses. And he discovered not one research paper on that proved, the, that, proved that viruses exist, not one, or that they cause illness. 
Not only that, there were no microscopic images of viruses available because they're believed to be too small to be detected. If they can't be detected with a microscope, then surely the logical question is, well, how do you know they exist? And yet they were being taught about viruses in medical school as if it was a proven, proven thing. See, most science is theory. It's not proof. Um, and other medical researchers, including Kerry Mullis, who created the PCR test, and by the way, warned that it was not to be used to diagnose particular, in, in particular illnesses because it all it indicated was that there were antibodies in the system. And we all know, we, we should know, that every time the body fights any sort of toxin, it produces antibodies. It's normal for our bodies to do that. It doesn't mean we are suffering from an invasive illness. And yet, one can guarantee 95% of people, despite that fact, will continue to claim they exist. Why? Because to have our deeply held beliefs challenged is frightening. If that's not true, then how many other beliefs are not true? To be empowered is to accept that the nature of our world is in fact that there is constant change. Nothing is ever completely known, and yet we can find evidence to support a stand that is in our best interest, and that's what we should be doing. What is in my best interest to know? People and animals come and go, plants come and go, the oceans ebb and flow, rocks break down by weathering, new rocks are released through volcanic activity and earthquakes. Our safety lies not in holding on to what is, but having the personal resources to navigate what might be in the future. But with common sense, with fearlessness, and it's worth remembering that people in government are far from expert in the areas of knowledge in which they are charged with making laws and regulations. If the experts are fallible, why do we trust the decisions of those without any professional training in the relevant field? They tell us to trust the experts and who knows who they regard as the experts? There are millions out there, but they choose one or two. Who are they choosing and why? Those with the real knowledge are those who ideally should make, be making the big decisions, but they don't have time and they don't have the skills. They're busy in their laboratories. It is up to us to seek them out because those with vested interests in particular outcomes will never take a balanced view and give it airtime. Another way our thoughts are manipulated is in social media where we see clips of notable persons saying or doing things that appear to compromise their integrity. It's so easy to tap into the fact that we tend to judge people primarily on how we look. You know, juries are largely chosen on impression. I personally will never um, take a, a, a short clip that you see in the news or online at face value. If I'm interested in that issue, then I'll always go to the full length interviews or um, conversations with the person or persons involved because that's the only way to place the clips in context and understand what's really going on. But those little short clips can be very persuasive. And Donald Trump is a great <laughs> subject for those clips. He's so easily demonized because he does have a big ego. He says some very strange things and his features are remarkable. It's easy to make fun of him. But if you actually watch full interviews of him when he was young, you see a very different picture of him. Uh, and it's easy to understand why for so many people his finer qualities, and he certainly has them too, override his other character flaws. Um, and the other obvious demon is Vladimir Putin. With his strange features and reserved personality, he gives the impression of being secretive, manipulative and overly powerful. 
But if you listen to what he has to say in interviews without looking at his face and make sure that you're listening to an accurate interpretation of what he's saying, because very often they're not, but a different impression emerges. But, you know, all people in the world are flawed, including leaders. So why do we just accept what they have to offer? Why do we accept that there are no other options available? Why are we not more discerning? This is generally. If our thoughts do be our own, the first step is to begin with an open mind. An open mind. Not a not a trash can that just absorbs everything, but listen to everything openly and consider it. Alvin Toffler was famously quoted as saying, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn and relearn. Those who cannot learn, unlearn and relearn will be the illiterate of the future. Interestingly, most of the videos I watch online, mostly interviews with experts in various fields, often display comments from viewers which are inane, uninformed and mostly about defending their own position or airing their own personal views rather than offering comments to create a conversation. A lot of them are just cutting off the conversation or totally irrelevant. And in most interest instances, it's very clear they are not well educated. As I said before, they're often semi-literate. They have no idea what the conversation is really about. Should that be a problem? Can you just ignore them? Well, yes, I think it can be a problem because they too are helping to, show, to shape public opinion. Very often in the direction of the demonstrably untrue, unfortunately, and they will create their own tribe who can be highly disruptive within the community. But should they be censored? Well, if you begin censorship, where does it end? Either none are censored or all are censored because who is fact-checking the fact-checkers? Think about my experience walking out the door and then turning around and going back and signing that check as if I was in a trance. And my waking up, thank goodness, we can wake up. We just need to be aware. We need to check everything we do. You'll find links to the videos I've mentioned in this podcast below and you can also go to my website nairij.com uh, if you want to find a little bit about my background and you can look at some of my paintings and listen to some music if you have the time and there's also a link to purchase my book Joffiel Whispers. Thank you for joining me. Please click the like button. And I hope to see you next time. Until then, stay well, stay blessed.